So thank you for the round of introductions, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Andre. I am the director of the Carlton Center for Community Engagement. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging that uh, <clears throat> where we work and study at Carleton University is on, <clears throat> excuse me, the traditional territory of the Algonquin people, the, the unceded traditional territories. And that uh, means a lot to us at 3CI. We do quite a few research projects that directly engage with indigenous partners around the country. And I think you'll hear about some of that uh, today and it was featured in past webinars and will be again in future webinars. Um, we really see community-based research as an important part of reconciliation really in this country, given that there's been a lot of bad research practice with indigenous peoples uh, historically and still ongoing, sadly. Um, as a, ca a catalyst and uh, convener in linking research practice and policy, 3CI seeks to serve local and national nonprofit, voluntary and philanthropic sectors, as well as Indigenous institutions and governments. We aim to enhance understanding and knowledge of the distinct contributions of these bodies to community vitality in Canada and beyond. 3CI is based at Carleton University, located on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation, and is committed to collaborative and Indigenous-led research. So today's webinar is focused on broadly principles and practices of community-based research and design. Um, I'm really excited to have uh, three presenters with us that you already met, but I'll just introduce them once again. Dr. Jill Clark, Fulbright Research Chair in North American Politics and currently visiting my Department of Political Science uh, from Ohio State University. So, so glad you can join us, Jill. Uh, we have Grace Martin, who is a PhD student in, in the School of Public Affairs and Policy Administration at Carleton. And she's cur currently working on a, a, a couple of projects that involve community-based research that she'll talk about. Uh, and then Dr. Chiara Del Gaudio uh, is assistant professor in the School of Industrial Design. And I'm particularly happy that Chiara is with us because to make that bridge from public affairs into uh, industrial design and hear what participation looks like on the design side, I'm, I'm excited to hear about that today. Um, so the way that we've designed this, uh, this event is we're not going to have each speaker give us a presentation. So it's really a round table. And so uh, we've uh, designed uh, three or four guiding questions. We're going to have each of our uh, presenters kind of give a couple of minutes of thoughts around the question. And then I'm going to open it up to the round table and we'll do that in kind of 15 minute chunks and that'll take us to two o'clock. Um, so I should just get right into it, given the timing we have. Um, you'll notice I didn't give a definition of community based research off the top, and that's because I want to start with seeing what this means for our presenters, our, our panelists, and then all of you. So what does community based research or participatory research or participatory design mean for you? What do you see as key principles of this approach to research or design? And I honestly can't remember who I said I would ask this of first. So I'm just going to go to Jill. And we'll go Jill, Chiara, and then Grace. Thanks, Peter. Um, you know, the, the, I was going to give a definition. I thought, no, no, no. Like, what would I tell my mom? Like, if my mom asked me this question, you know, I, I said, I'd tell her, hey, mom, community members, are doing things with me. I've shared some power in the research process, but probably most important to me is that they find value in, in what I'm doing. And I, I would say the one thing that I um, am struck by, and Peter, when you said participatory research or community-based research or participatory design, those are different things. And, and, and often I think one of the misunderstandings of community-based research is that you and the community members, and we'll talk about what community means in a little bit, that the community members must have the same research question. That's not been the case in my work. And I'm gonna give you two examples of when we don't have the same research question. One is where we're co-creating something of value between us. I might have a research question related to it, but my nonprofit partner, we might be creating data that they can use in a grant application. My grassroots coalition might be able to use those maps to target where they um, try to get their neighbors to join them in on a policy initiative. So you could be co-creating something that you're all using differently, kind of like a boundary object. And then the other example I wanna give 
is when you're doing more of the participatory research where I might have a research question, but my participation, um, I've been volunteering for 10 years with the same organization. It's a coalition, a food systems coalition. My, my service ends up being part of um, the reciprocity there. And anyway, I can get into kind of that long-term relationship, which is actually one of my first principles, and then I'll wrap up, is that, and I know this might not work for some of you who are working on master's theses or PhDs, but probably the, the thing I would say is think about this as a long-term relationship and not just a project. Um, my most fruitful work has been part of a decades long um, relationship with a, this group. And then two other quick things. One is don't assume everybody knows what you mean by research. There's, it's very ambiguous. Um, and finally, recognize there's a long history, a long institutional history that has come before you. And what you do um, and what you want to do is going to be layered on past experiences. And if you work with marginalized communities, those can oftentimes be deep, um, um, negative um, histories, like um, you know, in the neighborhoods around where I work. Um, and they may, um, community members may just also lump you in with a lot of institutional history that's very negative for their community. So just be aware of that. I'll, I'll pass it on. <laughs> Thank you, Zio. Uh, my answer will be a little bit uh, different in terms of focus, probably. Um, I work with uh, participatory action research and participatory design. I also recognize that there are different ways of understanding all these practices. Uh, and um, for instance, uh, recently in participatory design, uh, whose community I'm part of, uh, we have been discussing what participation means and uh, how it means something different in different cultures. So I'm quite open to, to change my understanding of it over time. Uh, at the current moment for me, or uh, it means merely um, within design and within this uh, research, a way to redistribute uh, power exercise or to have a different way of exercising power in, uh, in research and, and knowledge. In the production of knowledge, being that embodied in uh, artifacts, could be product service system processes, but well, uh, also in more conventional forms in which of knowledge. Uh, it also, uh, for me, means to um, uh, to decide together, um, at least in my, uh, to decide to do something I've been uh, thinking a lot recently. And probably a while ago, I was more on uh, Jill's side on this, on what, uh, what we should pr produce knowledge on. I think, and who should be part of this knowledge production. Um, at the same time, for me, it's a way to try to reduce the distance between academia and the real world, even more because I think that uh, knowledge is not produced uh, in uh, academia, not only, but is also produced through intervention, uh, intervention action, and that uh, an intervention action is, uh, is a cognitive process. Uh, and there is no knowledge and reality are in flux, and we can only follow those processes described. Uh, I think these are the three main things that for which I for, uh, use these approaches and uh, what they mean to me. Uh, key principles, I would say, openness to, <laughs> to changes, to divergent, divergent ideas and outcomes, and also be brave to, to accept them and embrace them. I would say being uh, in uncertainty, okay, be again brave to face that. And uh, in doing this, you probably need to listen and be in dialogue with what is who is there. Listen also to the field. This is something that I learned probably in the hard way <laughs> throughout my path. Um, so flexibility and at the same time embracing small and minimum quotation mark results. Uh, one thing that um, Jill mentioned is that this requires, it's not a project, uh, it's, uh, it's a long-term endeavor relationship. Uh, you become part of something and, uh, and uh, changes, transformation happens over a long period of time. 
you know, accept catastrophes or something like that. They require time and effort. So just be happy with them, embrace them. Yeah, I think that's it for me. Okay, please. Thanks. Um, yeah, so some of my uh, thoughts were gonna be, are gonna be echoing what others have already said. Um, but for me, I really see community-based research, uh, in particular research with indigenous communities, because I'm speaking to the experience um, of the, from the research I'm doing, um, as a means to foster interdisciplinary, cross-cultural, and intergenerational learning and knowledge transfer. Um, and the key principles of community-based research in this context, for me, are reflexivity, um, reciprocity, respect, and relationality. Um, and these are certainly not my ideas. Um, they come from critical Indigenous researchers such as Sean Wilson and Zoe Todd, among many others, as well as um, several Indigenous and non-Indigenous researchers that I'm uh, grateful to have the opportunity to work with in my research, um, as well as other mentors, uh, even in the school uh, at Carleton. Um, and so I could expand on each one of those, but um, very briefly, reflexivity, just meaning taking um, taking time and a concerted effort to recognize uh, positionality and, and bias, um, especially in my case from a settler perspective, a settler Canadian in this context of a research partnership with indigenous communities and nations and how that actually can impact um, research processes and outcomes. Uh, reciprocity simply meaning um, that there are mutual benefits, so benefits to community and those benefits are actually benefits that the community would find meaningful so not something that necessarily we like they also actually have to come from the community and then there's a way to actually ensure that those benefits are being accrued and then on equally benefits to institutions and researchers um, because there are many benefits of working in partnerships and those are not often um, being spoken about if, for example in grant applications the benefits are often stated as going to communities, but there are certainly several benefits to people like myself and others in the institution of academia. Um, and also being clear about that with the community, even in the informed consent uh, process, for example. Respect, being specific um, when talking about Indigenous communities and nations as specific as possible, um, and using appropriate terminologies and protocols, respecting the roles in the community, for example, the role of knowledge holders, elders, um, in research processes um, and relationality. Um, so that's a big one, but you know, could include principles around community agency and research, data sovereignty, ethics, informed consent, of course, but that can also extend to other um, concepts of relationality that uh, go beyond Western approaches and epistemologies and ontologies. Um, for example, the role of the researcher in relation to not only other people in the community or, um, but also or like other people, other researchers or about potentially other partners, um, but also, also non-humans, um, living things, but also non-living things as well. Um, and so th those are all very interesting to me and I could go on and on. And again, those are not my ideas. Those are um, ideas that I've um, been lucky to be able to learn about <laughs> through this process and I am still learning. So thank you. Ah, thank you, Jill, Chiara, and Grace. We, there's so many ideas and terms that just got uh, got thrown out into the space, and uh, I, I really appreciate how you, all three of you, have been in, able to encapsulate a lot of things. And words that stand out for me are uh, reciprocity, um, this question of of the the time engagement of uh, community based or participatory research and design, and how and how that sometimes puts you in relation to your institution's relationship or your organization's relationship with communities that uh, you need to be cognizant of. Uh, and then Grace, you know, these ideas of reflexivity, relationality. Um, what I also heard is, is uh, maybe you didn't say explicitly is transparency about who you are, or where you're coming from, that you're working on a degree, you will get a PhD at the end of this. What will the, your partners be getting at the end of it and how, how to be just transparent about all of that. Um, so I open it up to the floor now. Are there uh, maybe concepts that you heard that really resonate for you or others that you want to add to the mix? You can raise your virtual hand um, or uh, put some thoughts into the chat and uh, we'll just 
love to hear what others are thinking as they're listening to this before we move to the next question. Kathy, go ahead. Can always count on me to have a question. Um, so I found this absolutely intriguing and like this could be the whole discussion um, talking about this and my mind is already going, well, oh, wait a second, how does this fit? Um, I'm really curious in, um, I think Kiara and Grace, I, I can't remember if Jill touched on it or not, um, this concept of, of community being like not also including perhaps non-living resources. Um, and I, and then if you take your principles that you're talking about, do those principles alter or change? Or are they consistent when you're talking about the non-human or non-living concept of community? Thank you, Kathy. And um, you know what? The next question that I happen to have on the agenda is what does community mean in the, in the work that you do? And how does this relate to who you work with and how you work with them? Um, and so I, I feel like I just want to put that into the mix as well. And then, but maybe with particular attention, because Grace explicitly mentioned working with uh, the non, more than human, shall we say, in the community around us. And uh, Kiara also talked about, uh, you know, the relationship with artifacts and places. Mm -hmm. um, so I invite, uh, I, I also see there's something in the chat. We'll come back to that, but maybe I'm just going to, take Kathy's question and wrap it up with this other question of what does community mean and how do you engage with communities? Is it all of community? Is it some parts of community? Kara, would you like to go first on this? Yeah, okay. That's a little, quite a difficult question, the one you posed, uh, both uh, you, Peter, and Kathy. Um, community. <laughs> community for me is, uh, or first of all, community, Probably speaking, my understanding and something that is uh, something common. Uh, usually, I work with uh, the urban space, uh, but could be also something different. They have uh, an interest in common, like uh, more recently in a project I'm in, they uh, think about certain type of design approach, developing certain type of knowledge, or they may be the members of a uh, of a of a company. I don't know the, the employees. So, um, for me, they are mainly my, 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 my partners and probably my work usually aims to um, bring the community, um, show the community that there is a community there. And so try to work as a designer on those on the elements that ties those uh, those uh, those people together and they say people why I say people I know there are other things there. We and they influence uh, the design and the research process. But something that uh, in, the, in design we're discussing a lot recently, designing for more than human, okay, including you know both the cyborg dimension or cyber dimension, and uh, as well as spiritual um, understand uh, spiritual beings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Or, uh, but um, I think there is a lot of. Um, when we do this in design, there is a lot of, first of all, arrogance in trying to, you know, we, we look at them and we try to include them from uh, a human perspective. So we try to understand them from that. That is also the only point where we can start, but it's really every time we, we keep informing that that way. At the same time, in design at least, in research, I can talk only for research and design, we still disregard our participants a lot when it comes to the process and to uh, the knowledge production. So from my point of view, but that's my point of view, maybe we should start there. We should strengthen that first, because uh, one of the reasons for which I stress the relevance of agreeing with them on what we research and what is going on is that a lot of time, the same in my case, I work more with discrim uh, discrimination, marginalization, those dynamics are uh, repeated in how we produce uh, knowledge. 
So they are my partners and probably they are what I want to become part of throughout the process, what I become part of and what uh, inspires me in uh, changing design, rethinking design that at the current moment has been taught from uh, a practice uh, from a Western perspective. So uh, Western and Eurocentric, uh, Northocentric perspective. So yeah, this is what is community for me, is inspiration and what I hope to be part of. Thank you, Chiara. Uh, Grace, do you want to uh, deal with this question next? Uh, and I found your, your answer on that, Chiara, about um, yes, there is the more than human that we can consider as agents in uh, design processes, but until we really are figuring out how to work well with the human participants and agents in these processes, maybe begin there. It's sort of what I, what I heard you uh, saying. Uh, Grace. Uh, sure. So um, I'll just I'll try to focus more on the the, the question um, about the non-human, but I'll I will just start a bit more broadly. So um, my research is is concerned with effective, equitable, holistic approaches to policy and governance processes and structures, like I mentioned. So whether that's related to implementing land claims or um, to improving resource co-management structures, and I'm specifically looking at fisheries policy, um, which is important for this question, important context. And so the community here that I'm working with, it to me that most importantly, it does it does mean the indigenous, uh, or I should say the Dene uh, research partners that we're working with. Um, so in, uh, there are a couple of different projects I am involved in, but I'll sp speak specifically to the project that I'm working um, on that's with Delaney researchers. So Satu Otene or uh, Great Lake people or Bear Lake people, I should say. And they're um, located on Great Bear Lake on the Northwest Territories. It's a community of about 600 people. Um, and it's the only community on the lake and the lake is in near pristine condition. And there are, there are these uh, fish populations which are um, extremely healthy, like relatively healthy, but like in this day and age for fish, <laughs> very healthy. Um, and there are of course threats from climate change and um, other factors, but um, something that's become very clear in the research is the relationships among community members and fish and the cultural significance of the lake um, itself. Uh, Walter Beza is our community research lead in Delaney, and he refers to Bear Lake as an icon, um, meaning you you listen to Bear Lake, like if, if, if the weather conditions are not, um, if they're windy or wavy, you listen. Um, and it's difficult for me to try to paraphrase this knowledge and these stories from him because it's not my knowledge. So I'm aware of that as I'm trying to do it, but I think it's still a useful, it's still useful to try. Um, and another aspect is the relationship to fish. So the cultural significance of fish and, and because my research is looking at, or I, I should say our research in this context, some of it is, is kind of for my PhD and some of it is ours. And that's a whole other question. But because it's looking at um, fisheries policy, it's a, a good example of this is for me has been trying is has been unlearning notions of um, of environmental policy planning and management. And so what would be the Dene equivalent of those um, and and why do we think that this that Dene knowledge needs to fit within Western or dominant paradigms. Um, when I asked Walter about what he thought about the co-management regime or uh, current environmental policy it's he understands that and he has a great respect for it but at the same time he's he says we're already monitoring the lake through our own har harvesting our our respect for the land and our relationships to fish is the way that we take care of fish we don't we don't need like a law like it goes beyond law and it's there's spiritual elements and so there's been a lot of unlearning and learning and for me, and it's still a process um, where I'm continuing to learn, but I, I, I maybe that starts to answer the question, but you can see that like in a policy school, like I have a biology background, I'm asking about policy and management and he's talking about the love of the environment and the love of fish and how he's on the same level of, as fish 
and they and essentially in their culture you learn from caribou you learn from fish you learn from the lake and manage like you don't manage the environment <laughs> it doesn't need us we're part of it and humans are not managing anything so that's I that's not a, I didn't plan on answering that question so I mean, <laughs> hopefully that kind of communicated what I'm some of in part because it's not really my it is again the community's perspective so I wish he was here to speak to that but thanks thank you for the opportunity to try oh, great. <laughs> so that's a really interesting response to Kathy's question and what I heard and this relates actually to what Kiara was saying as well but in, in your response um the more than human comes in by uh, challenging the, the Western ontology that holds uh, the people and their lake and their fish as somehow separate. And that you're only doing, re you're not only doing research with the people, <laughs> you're doing pe relationship with the people in that place and in those relationships. And that's all, when you approach it from that direction, then the more than human is, is present. Yes, thank you for bringing that back to that. And like a very quick example is, you know, on our informed consent form, including the lake, including the fish mm. in that, in acknowledgements and presentations, including the lake, including the fish species in that, in those, and not in a way that is, is genuine. And, and ultimately when we're in the community showing respect, I'm sure there's cultural protocols around that that I don't even know yet that I'll need to learn before I'm there. So that's a great question, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Kathy, for that question. I'm gonna turn it to Jill now uh, with uh, the broader question again, what does community mean for you and uh, your work and what does that mean? Well, you know, I think it's, um, you know, broadly, you know, the, well, let me actually answer it this way, which is in my work, I see there's such power in, being the holder of who gets to define a community in the first place. And there's a lot of power there and it can be used to support decisions or reinforce decisions by invoking the community. And so I see this in action where community, right, supported this, right? Um, and so community, um, I've seen it just used in its vague way because, you know, boundaries of communities are fluid and contingent um, to really reinforce a direction that a researcher wanted to go. Um, when community is called community, that's when it gets dangerous. I think the flip side of that is being really specific about what you mean by community holds you accountable to community. And so, um, yeah, so there's just a lot of power there um, and um, it could be used um, to be accountable or it can be used to gloss over um, uh, a broad swath of, of people and groups and places and, and um, the environment, the fish and the caribou <laughs> um, in a way that um, um, justifies action. So I'll just, I don't know if that's exactly what you were looking for, but Peter, that's what I've been thinking as we've been talking about community. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jill. Um, I want to, um, <clears throat> I want to get to one of the questions that, uh, that uh, Serena introduced earlier. She says something I've really struggled to wrap my head around is how community-based participatory research differs from participatory design or co-design work would love if someone could help to differentiate the two. Um, and I'm gonna start here and then maybe turn it over to Chiara. Um, I, I was looking for my definition of community-based research on my computer very quickly. I'm not seeing it, but I'll just give you my understanding of basically something like the current Community-Based Research Canada definition is something like having the, 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 the research, the people that you're working with uh, be involved in all stages of the research process from draft, designing the question, informing research methodology, helping to gather data, interpreting results and helping to disseminate uh, results and, and lead to outcomes. Um, and that's a high bar. And I'm just putting it out there because I think that's where participatory research 
coming out of the work of Paolo Freire and people like that, uh, very much working, wanting to empower those who are most marginalized and have them become part of the research process. That's where these ideas started, let's say in the 60s and 70s. Um, and it is a high bar to have your uh, participants be part of all stages of that process. And frankly, there are times when some of the people we work with don't want to be part of all stages in that process. And in my mind, community-based research is maybe uh, a broader umbrella that, that, that maybe says, you know, there, that community, your involvement of community can happen in different ways in different places in the ways that they want to engage, which often still means in the design of the question, maybe in deciding methodology, but maybe not in gathering data definitely in interpreting data and so on. Anyways, that's just my kind of uh, off the, uh, the cuff set of definitions. And now I'm really curious to hear how Chiara sees either of these terms or how it relates to what is considered participatory design and co-design. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's also, I usually my students are confused. Okay, what is the difference between doing design and doing research in design? Um, and I can understand the confusion they have. Uh, so when you do design, you design something, broadly speaking. It can be, again, process, product, service, system, whatever you want, policy. Uh, but, uh, and you can have a research part in, this, in that process, okay? But that research aims at the, the, the design of, let's say, product design of an artifact, okay? Uh, when you do research in design, and I agree that that is knowledge too, but if knowledge is just there, might not uh, be able to help us uh, understand the reality, okay? Um, the, the research in design is a process that can include the design process, uh, like the design of an artifact, but it also aims at reflecting on that and uh, sharing some learnings of what happened, based on what happened. This learnings can be on the design process, on the, the design outcome or whatever, okay? So that's the difference between the two things in design. So for me, there is a difference between uh, participatory research, participatory design. Participatory design is when usually design is, maybe is the essence is a decision-making process that informs reality. For this, we can design with everything as design. So everything, someone designed that being designers, being and other people that acted as designers and that have, you know, uh, comp uh, skills, expertise to do that, but everything is designed. So if we open up the process, we share the decision-making power and our power of making reality. I agree with Peter having people there all the time. It's kind of, you know, I wanted them all the time, the first time that I practiced participatory design, that people have other interests, uh, needs, or other things. Not everybody can be there all the time, skills sometimes uh, too. So I'm more, uh, you know, flexible the current moment on that. But broadly speaking, is when the design of something is uh, that process is shared. Is is I'm going to use this uh, glass. It's not someone else decide how to how the glass should be, but we do this together. It might not even be a glass in the end. Okay, participatory uh, research is uh, something that. Uh, uh, it's also the, uh, it's a, a wider process. So I can have participatory design within a participatory research. Two things often will overlap, but broadly speaking, we also reflect on the process or on the outcome and uh, share that knowledge uh, with a wider community and being that uh, academic or, or not. That for me is uh, participatory research in, in a nutshell, really. Okay, I, I, but I don't know if I help understanding the difference between the two of them. Um, okay, and that's really a basic definition. Great, thank you, Chiara. Okay, one thing, co-design and participatory design, those are two different things. Co-design can be done by Apple because we want to design something that people will have a better, uh, will buy more and will be better for people. Co uh, participatory design is usually, a, I really understand the political dimension of design and the design process. So there, it's kind of a statement too. You share the decision-making not to benefit the company, but uh, the people that are there in the process. Okay, so
Great, thank you for those uh, clarifications. Really great to, to hear those distinctions as you see them. Um, I, if I can, Jill, I wanna turn the next question over to you because I think you have some experience here. And this also comes from Bridget who says, uh, in exploring community philanthropy and participatory grant making, I've been thinking a lot about participatory decision making in groups of and with community members and the interpersonal skills involved. I'm very interested to hear the relevance of and how group based group based participatory decision making is facilitated within the community and the skills developed, if it's even relevant. I'm also going to while Jill is speaking, I'm going to put a little link in the chat to she's going to be giving a, a seminar in our department on April seventh, I think, on um, inclusion and participation in uh, governance processes and. This is why I'm putting the question to Jill. I think there are things about this question that you, that you can speak to in terms of uh, the skills and capacity within community to be part of participatory processes. Well, uh, first, you don't want me facilitating. <laughs> um, and that's really recognizing in, in our group processes um, that um, facilitators wield a lot of power. And um, trying to get someone who is outside of the process, who does not have a stake in the power, who does their own kind of reflection on their positionality, I think is really important. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about a specific case um, of work in Cleveland um, where there were um, not only skill differentials, but great um, power differentials between um, community members. Um, so we have, um, we're working um, in four communities, uh, four neighborhoods where people who have lived experience in food insecurity are part of um, the community-based research process. And some of, the, some of what we did was learn together and learn from each other, but we also designed kind of what would be called like enclave uh, capacity building for, so, um, our um, folks that had the lived experience of food insecurity um, uh, actually uh, met outside and were paid to meet outside of our processes to build their own capacity as a group. Um, in addition to then things that we did, um, which was you know have a, a, a good facilitator, but also um, learn together. Um, the related to this, um, I would say that. Um, we all had to um, kind of um, bring a little humility and, and, and start to um, articulate with one another kind of what are the gifts that we, that we can bring and, and force everyone to, to not only see their own gifts, but each other's gifts. Um, and so there was just a lot of time spent talking about um, what, do we, what do we mean by what we bring to the table um, what don't we bring? Um, what do we want to learn together for? I don't know if this is getting to the answer to that question, but um, I, I think the biggest takeaway for, for me in thinking about skill building is recognizing that sometimes to build equity, you build inequity in process by providing a lot more time and resources to, to um, some members uh, to increase their capacity. Thank you, Jill. Um, I'm going to read out a question that uh, Winona introduced in the chat, and then I'll turn it over to Doreen to uh, make her comment or question. And um, then I'm just going to see where we're at at that point. And we might, I'm, I'm hoping that we might still get to the third topic, but we're going to see where we're at once this comes out. So uh, Winona says, I have a question related to protecting the intellectual property of community members lived experience, traditional knowledge, et cetera. How do we ensure this? Do we list the community or members or as authors of our papers? How else can we honor as well as protect this knowledge? So uh, I see Grace maybe nodding. So maybe I'll see if you want to speak to this in a second, but I'll turn it to Doreen first. Doreen? Um, I wanted to uh, bring up uh, service design um, in particular for communities. Uh, I've noticed that for retailers, uh, working with large retailers, they don't particularly look at community um, needs because they feel that they know what they want. 
and this is pretty broad, um, but I've been working in the food industry. So I see it that independents, like independent uh, food stores really rely on community or so they say to help them um, innovate. Um, but they are in serious decline in Canada um, because we have a very, you know, we have a self-regulated system. Um, it's going to change now, um, starting probably April. They're going to start regulating or proposing regulation, but this doesn't often happen. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, I mean, it gets very complicated too, um, because you know these services are sometimes in small communities, much more easier to engage with communities, but in large cities, um, it's kind of overlooked, but there are, tends to be a lot of innovation within um, large cities that you might not see in small communities. But I'm just wondering because things happen so slowly here um, in Canada, unfortunately with regulations, is there any kind of, do you know of any kind of funding or any kind of movements within the government to show some kind of progress in community engagement? Uh, that's a, that's a, a big broad question, uh, Doreen, that you ended on with, uh, do we see progress in government in uh, community engagement? Wow. Um, like any kind of funding resources or do you see any kind of sparks Right. Uh, well, I have to say that uh, in the Canadian context, now I'm thinking about the research funding context, say the tri-councils of uh, health research, CIHR, um, SHRC, uh, NSERC. Uh, my perception is over the last 10 years, 10, 20 years, that there's been a real acceptance, uh, in even embracing of community-based research in various programs. Um, uh, in particularly in Indigenous research, but also in many other research areas. You know, in Indigenous research, it's almost required now, and in so many other areas of research. Um, so uh, while it isn't yet the norm in many academic disciplines, uh, the, certainly the research funders, I would say, are quite supportive. Sometimes it's just a matter of also finding a supervisor <laughs> that is supportive of your project using these uh, methodologies. Um, Okay, so, uh, but I'll, I'll see if anybody else wants to speak to this. I, we're down to the last five minutes. So what I'm gonna do is basically, we have this question from uh, Winona. Um, I wonder if uh, maybe Grace wants to speak to that. Uh, and then what I'm gonna do is, is give a chance for a last uh, uh, sort of minute and a half to each of our speakers to address any of the topics that we've been talking about today that they still wanna kind of come back on, including questions they've heard, uh, and or to discuss any kind of uh, lessons that they've learned from their work or that they that they want to still work, uh, learn moving forward, because we just have a few minutes left. So Grace, over to you first. Okay, I'll keep it quick. I, there's a lot. This is a really important discussion, the area of data sovereignty, ultimately. Um, there's a lot on this. And I'm very happy to speak with you about this after too. But the short answer, I think, is really if you're in a position where you're already working with the community, ask the community, ask the research lead, ideally that person, you have one or two contacts that can work, like that can represent the community. Um, and then follow those and honor those protocols that are ideally already established if they're not established then the role it becomes to work to establish those protocols and have them written down and have a research agreement that clearly states what is going to happen and that can be on the they can all be on the informed consent um forms um and you can look to there's it's like speaking of government like sure there's the tri-council policy statement um has a course free course around ethics but more specific to data sovereignty is the principles of ocap the first uh, ownership control access and possession is specific to data sovereignty that's a course that you can take through algonquin college for about 200 dollars. i was very lucky to take it um because i'm involved in research projects associated um with carlton with 3CI. And um, so I'm very, I believe I learned a lot there. I would direct you there. But basically, ideally, if the community is being involved in all the stages of research, 
if they want to be, then that will be easier to get a clear idea. If not, then establishing a governance process and, and really point like work and it might mean the re, you re, as a research as the academic researcher writing down those protocols and having them be like consulting on them um, and making sure people agree to those. We're in the process of doing that. But yeah, there's data sharing agreements, data management, research agreements, statements of principles, and there's a lot of information out there. Um, it's a really important area. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I'll keep it at that. Thank you, Grace. Uh, yeah, I agree that there are practices, there are protocols. I put in a link to the ownership, control, access, and possession of uh, data from the uh, uh, First Nations uh, Information Governance Center, which is, I think, at Tyendinaga. Um, and uh, so you can link into that. I also just want to mention before we turn it now to Jill and Chiara for their final thoughts is a few links up. I put in a link to a seminar feedback form for this seminar. So if I'd love it if you click on it so that when we close it, you'll still have a window on your computer where you can just give us your feedback on this event and what you'd like to hear in future. So uh, for some final thoughts, I'll turn it first to uh, Jill. Thanks, Peter. Um, I just dropped in the chat uh, a new report out for what we learned from listening to our neighbors. Many of our neighbors around Ohio State University's campus are um, low-income minority um, uh, residents. And so um, in case you find that interesting, I'm just going to leave you with this, something really embarrassing, um, some pitfall I want to avoid in the future. I love learning. I love research. I really do. And when I find like cool findings, I get really excited. And most recently, I have findings about um, the link between racism and decision makers in our community. And, and I was nerding out on like the p-value of um, uh, a finding while talking to my black colleague who is doing this research with me. And he kind of just sat back and he's like, oh, Jill, like, do you hear your voice? Like, do you, you're, you are getting really excited about something that I, I live every day. And I was reminded of this isn't the first time that I've gotten really excited about a research finding and something really, I think it was meaningful, but I'm so detached from it. Um, and so I hope to, you know, bring a little bit more of um, learning from that in the future. So a pitfall is when you're a researcher and you're separated from what you're researching, you, you, you just have to keep that in mind. Don't, don't do what I just, just did. Um, so I'll leave you with that embarrassing moment and hopefully a lesson learned. Thank you, Jill. It, I'm so glad you mentioned this pitfall. For, for the students who are here, you will make mistakes and you'll learn from them. And uh, this is still very important work. Kiara. Uh, one is that um, as we saw here today, every content is different. So don't expect to have rules or to have the same understanding of uh, community-based research or participatory research or participatory design everywhere. It uh, really depends on who you're working with and where you're working and when. And the other thing is that uh, I totally agree with uh, Jira, but also say, get really to know the context really well. Uh, don't just, you know, do it quickly first, because there are a lot of things that uh, if you might be, get yourself into power relations you're not aware of, uh, say, uh, discover something that was already there, a lot of things will, uh, so really spend some time there. You cannot be, uh, you cannot just do this in a naive or superficial way. We can hear you, Peter. Thank you very much, Chiara, Jill, and Grace for joining us today. And thank you to all our participants for being here. It was just one action-packed hour. Thank you so much to Jen Harrison from uh, 3CI for organizing all of this and making it work technically. Um, really want to thank all of our participants. Please, there is a link there in the chat before we sign off. Please open it on your computer, give us your feedback. And uh, we do hope to do another one of these in about a month's time. So stay tuned. We'll let everybody on this list know about our next event. Thanks so much and have a, have a great day. Thank you.